Welcome to this webinar. We are going to summarize and hit the high points of chapter one of my book, Fibromyalgia Solved. But when you get the book, please read the entire chapter as there is much more than we are able to get in this presentation. We are going to cover the theory of how sleep apnea causes fibromyalgia and much of chronic pain. I might add that more healthcare professionals are coming to the same conclusion. Here's the disclaimer for the book. The information in this book and lectures are intended for educational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. Only a physician familiar with your individual medical history can give you personal medical advice. I have an additional online disclaimer. I can only answer health questions from my patients. I cannot answer questions about your health online or through emails. The information is general information only, nothing specific to any one person. So let's get started. I'm going to summarize a few key points from the first sections of the chapter. What are the symptoms of fibromyalgia? The hallmark symptom of fibromyalgia is widespread, ongoing musculoskeletal pain that does not respond to treatment and is not otherwise explained. Other common symptoms include fatigue and mild depression. In other words, they hurt all over, they get tired easy, and they have a mental fog, which is often called fibrofog. The book has a much more exhaustive list, but these are the big three, and we will see them all the time if we start to look for them and ask our patients about them. The next sections of the chapter that we're not going to cover are history of the fibromyalgia diagnosis and then alloying, which is a painful response to pressure. How prevalent is fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is estimated to affect between 2 to 4 percent of the population. We have all heard the stat that there is a female to male ratio of approximately 9 to 1. This 9 to 1 ratio comes from the early literature. With the work I've done in treating fibromyalgia, I believe that men are greatly underreported. I find a one to one or equal ratio of women to men. Men are told that they have arthritis or if the one area hurts more than the other areas that they need a surgery. I also find men only complaining about their biggest area of pain. They do not report hurting all over until I query deeper into their symptoms. We will see in a few minutes that sleep apnea is the cause of fibromyalgia. Men and women have sleep apnea at an even occurrence and I find that they have fibromyalgia at the same equal occurrence. So how did I get involved with researching and treating fibromyalgia? I had a patient, a close relative, who I felt had fibromyalgia who I wanted to help. The lack of a treatment led me to study, research, develop theories, and work through my ideas to find the cause. This process took three years. Once this breakthrough happened, I then spent three to four more years working with my patients to create treatment protocols that work. I approached unraveling fibromyalgia by looking at it as a primarily muscular problem. There are many symptoms of fibromyalgia, but my patients came to me as a chiropractor for their musculoskeletal complaints, and any list of fibromyalgia symptoms would put muscular pain at the top. Working with the musculoskeletal system made me uniquely qualified to interpret and go after the muscular problem theory as opposed to such theories as autoimmune or nerve hypersensitivity. My study patient was an otherwise healthy male in his 40s who had chronic muscle spasms not responding to therapy for seemingly no reason. I knew his pains were muscular, not articular, not nerve pain, not pain associated with an illness. His pains seemed to be chronic muscle spasms. What would cause muscles to continually contract in the absence of trauma or illness? After much thought and study about possible physiological mechanisms, I theorized that a chronic lack of oxygen to the muscles would be a good concept to start with. So my theory was low oxygen to the muscles. This was an overriding theory. My first work in theory of what would cause a lack of oxygen get in the muscles was anemia. A person with anemia has low hemoglobin in their blood, which causes their blood to have a reduced ability to deliver oxygen to the body tissues. I had my patient get blood work for anemia. His ferritin levels came back borderline anemic. I thought my theory was off to a good start. He gave blood regularly, he did not eat leafy green vegetables, and he had a low protein diet. These things can lead to low iron in the blood, which when severe enough leads to low hemoglobin, which leads to low oxygen saturation. So iron supplementation was suggested and started, as well as an increase in protein in his diet. Follow-up blood work showed his iron levels returned to normal. However, he experienced no change in his fibromyalgia symptoms. Therefore, I went back to the drawing board for a new theory. What else could be the cause of his chronic muscle spasms? At this time, I had a respiratory therapist as a patient. I would run my ideas past her. 
She tested my patient with a spirometer or a lung capacity test and stated that he had the lung capacity of a 70-year-old. The spirometer reading suggested that something was wrong with his breathing. I had my patient do lung exercises, which did nothing to help his muscular pain. He purchased a breathing product that required him to inhale and exhale with increased force. This product is for athletes who want to increase their lung capacity. However, he already worked out three to four days a week and was not out of shape. As a result, this lung exercise did nothing to help his spirometry readings or his chronic pain. Somewhere around this time, I got to thinking that if his diaphragm muscles weren't working well, that he may be in primarily breathing with his accessory breathing muscles, his chest and ribcage muscles, which would lead to shallow breathing. Try taking a very deep breath with only your accessory breathing muscles and not use your diaphragm you'll notice that you're greatly inhibited. This turned out to be the case and is why he had the lungs of a 70-year-old on the spirometry test, even though he could exercise well. He really did not have the lungs of a 70-year-old. He is primarily an accessory muscle breather. Later, he would redo the spirometry test with the correct deep diaphragm breathing technique and his test results became correct for his age. So my patient was not breathing well with his diaphragm. I discussed the spirometry findings with my respiratory therapist, who suggested the patient do an overnight oximetry test, or a pulse ox test, which gave him the reading of mild to moderate sleep apnea. This showed he was not breathing at night. When I went over the results of the overnight test, he additionally reported that he would occasionally stop breathing during the day. So my patient had an underperforming diaphragm and sleep apnea. Next, I asked myself, what would cause the diaphragm to perform poorly? I readily remember the mnemonic from school, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. Thus, pressure on the spinal nerves of C345 could, theoretically, cause the diaphragm to work poorly. My patient did have extreme forward head carriage. His forward neck posture was quite pronounced, not just a little forward. So this became my latest theory, that pressure on C345 would lead to a poorly working diaphragm leading to sleep apnea. I gave my patient the neck exercise anterior to posterior glides to bring his head posterior. My patient already used a correct pillow and had good sleep posture. These neck exercises restored approximately 50% of his curve. This was enough to take the pressure off the nerves. It worked. His pulse ox test returned to normal, which demonstrated that his sleep apnea had resolved and his fibromyalgia symptoms disappeared 100%. He continued to do the exercises for one and a half years with almost complete success. At one point, he stopped doing the exercises and his fibromyalgia symptoms returned. Then he resumed the exercises and his fibromyalgia symptoms quickly abated. Further treatments outlined in the treatment chapter were added over time, including neck stretching, which permanently fixed the forward head carriage so he didn't have to do the AP glides forever. Why stretching is permanent and exercise is temporary is discussed in the treatment chapter. This is one of the ways to know if a treatment works. No symptoms when a person does the treatment and the returning of the symptoms when they do not. Therefore, the ADP glide exercises and later stretching were successful at bringing his neck posterior enough that his breathing and his overnight oximetry reading returned to normal. And best of all, his fibromyalgia disappeared. So I had fixed my first fibromyalgia patient. Next, I would begin to expand treatment to additional patients. As my usual patients would come in, occasionally some of them would have the big three symptoms of fibromyalgia, chronic pain, tire easily, and many would have a mental fog. However, they did not have extreme forward head carriage. So what was the cause? Now, I did not have to discover a completely new cause of fibromyalgia. I knew sleep apnea caused my first patient's condition. All I had to do was look into the various causes of sleep apnea. I again consulted with my respiratory therapist who taught me much about sleep apnea. I started to question my patients and check them with overnight pulse oximetry testing, and slowly the answers began to come forth. It became clear that almost every one of my patients with fibromyalgia had sleep apnea. We will see in the diagnosis chapter that extreme forward head carriage only counts for around 1 to 1.5% 1 of sleep apnea, and thus fibromyalgia. There are two much more common causes outlined. The current medical position is that fibromyalgia causes sleep disturbances, including sleep apnea. If you look at any symptoms list for fibromyalgia, you'll find sleep disturbances, including sleep apnea, are one of the main symptoms. However, here's the light bulb moment. Fibromyalgia does not cause sleep apnea. It is the other way around. Sleep apnea causes an oxygen lack, more on this later, which leads to fibromyalgia. Because doctors feel that the sleep apnea is a result of fibromyalgia, the sleep apnea is not treated. As I look back, 
I realized that approaching my research to circle around a lack of oxygen was right on. It took a lot of work to flush it all out. So I had discovered that oxygen lack causes fibromyalgia. It caused the muscle spasms, fatigue, and mental fog of my patient. But how? What is the physiological mechanism? Let's look at how the body uses oxygen. Oxygen is unique when compared to other macronutrients. Our bodies can store water, protein, carbohydrates, and fats, but we cannot store oxygen. We need a constant, ongoing, and optimal supply of oxygen. These next few quotes are from Guyton and Hall's Textbook of Medical Physiology. Oxygen is used by the cells of our body for energy. It is released at the cellular level to produce energy in the citric acid cycle. In the citric acid cycle, energy is created when ADP is transformed into ATP. This energy is stored in ATP molecules and is used by the cells for three major uses, membrane transport, protein synthesis, and muscle contraction. Regarding this third major use of muscle contraction, ATP is used to supply energy for special cells or muscle fibers to perform mechanical work. Each contraction of a muscle fiber requires expenditure of tremendous quantities of ATP. When we sleep, our bodies do not need as much energy for muscle contraction. As the body slows down, our breathing slows down as well. Blood flow is diverted from the muscles, bone, and skin and is made more available to the brain and other vital organs. At rest, the muscles use as little as 4 milliliters per minute per 100 grams of blood, while the vital organs use much more. In comparison, the brain uses 50 milliliters, the liver 95 milliliters, and the heart 70 milliliters. Thus, during resting conditions, the muscles are at the bottom of the blood flow totem pole. In addition, the body is 40% muscle and thus affected significantly when energy or ATP storage resources are low. As a result, when a person has sleep apnea, which often lasts much of the night, it leads to oxygen lack, which leads to the muscles being low on ATP. When the muscle cells are low on ATP, they do not have the energy to perform work. Thus, the muscles become exhausted, leading to muscle spasms, which of course are painful. Sleep apnea's oxygen lack creates a double negative effect on the muscle system. The first is the damaging effects from the oxygen lack as described in the previous paragraph, muscle exhaustion. The second is the disruption in the sleep time healing process. Healing takes place when we sleep. Oxygen is needed for the healing process by providing the energy of the cells and protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is the second major use of oxygen noted previously. The body takes care of things like resolving inflammation and muscle spasms best at night when there's no competition for resources. This is why we sleep when we're sick. Our bodies use the sleep time to fight the illness, whatever the illness. Especially at risk is the healing of the muscular system when somebody has sleep apnea because the muscles are already exhausted from sleep apnea. Thus, an oxygen lack exhausted muscle that needs sleep time to heal is met with an oxygen lack decrease in healing from decreased protein synthesis and thus experiences a double negative effect. Everyone gets simple aches and pains that heal quickly. People with ongoing nightly oxygen lack get this two punch effect and their simple aches and pains do not resolve. This is where the 18 tender points of fibromyalgia come from, simple aches and pains not resolving. So much of the pain with fibromyalgia comes from the chronic muscle spasms not being able to heal each night. In other words, there is an ongoing re-aggravation of affected muscles. Additionally, these muscles are prone to injury during the daytime. Besides the two-punch attack against the muscle system, what else is impaired by the oxygen lack caused by sleep apnea? The very symptoms of fibromyalgia, fatigue, including chronic fatigue, mental fog, non-restorative sleep, restless leg, and even possible depression are among the results. Even though the body saves blood flow for the vital organs during sleep, during sleep apnea, there's still not enough oxygen supply to the brain. The brain is active at night and continues to need high levels of oxygen. As a result, the brain gets low levels of oxygen combined with high levels of carbon dioxide. More on carbon dioxide buildup in a minute. When a person has a more severe level of sleep apnea, they may wake up sweating, have chest discomfort, and have a certain amount of anxiety. Additionally, there are other sleep apnea symptoms not associated with fibromyalgia. Even nighttime heart attacks may be triggered by sleep apnea, as well as an increased risk of stroke. Let's talk about carbon dioxide. Not only is there a lack of oxygen with sleep apnea, but there's a buildup of carbon dioxide. 
This can be demonstrated on patients who have a more severe level of sleep apnea. These patients can have an odd urine odor in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. This odor is likely carbon dioxide. When a person has sleep apnea, their lungs are not performing enough of their work. Not only are they not getting enough oxygen, but they are also not breathing out enough carbon dioxide waste. Therefore, the carbon dioxide builds up in the blood and backs up in the various tissues and organs, including the brain. This is most likely where the fibro fog comes from, low levels of oxygen and high levels of carbon dioxide. In addition, the carbon dioxide that is not expired by the lungs stays in the bloodstream and is filtered out by the kidneys producing urine. In high enough concentrations, seen in people with more severe sleep apnea, it will produce this odd urine odor immediately following a significant episode of sleep apnea. When I explain this oxygen lack concept to patients, I tell them, we are oxygen-based creatures. If you put your head in a bucket of water for six minutes, you'll die. When you have sleep time oxygen lack for multiple hours every night, it greatly affects your health. This is why there are so many symptoms for sleep apnea and thus for fibromyalgia as well. Earlier, we discussed how prevalent fibromyalgia is. Now we'll discuss how prevalent sleep apnea is. Obstructive sleep apnea is very common. Estimates are as high as 20% of the population for mild sleep apnea and 6% for moderate to severe. I think it's more like 10% as I believe doctors undertreat sleep apnea and put the bar too high for what they consider moderate to severe. We'll discuss this at length in the diagnosis and treatment lecture. A recent study concluded that one in five American adults have at least mild obstructive sleep apnea. That translates to 40 million people. Approximately one third of that number has moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Again, I think it's closer to one half. I have found even mild sleep apnea is enough to cause the level of oxygen lack needed for muscles to go into chronic spasm, causing the muscular symptoms of fibromyalgia. Sleep apnea is very common. As stated in the email sent out, 20% of doctors listening have mild sleep apnea and 10% have more moderate to severe. So I call this type of fibromyalgia oxygen lack fibromyalgia. This is a subcategory of fibromyalgia and is a new concept. I believe it is by far the main cause, but I do not claim it is the only one. This is discussed at greater length in the book. There are additional sections in chapter one, which we aren't going to cover here, but please read them. There is a section on deprived stages of sleep and fibromyalgia. How does trauma lead to fibromyalgia? Now this is a real interesting section. Many people state that their fibromyalgia started with trauma. This section lays out how they previously had sleep apnea, but they are not yet experiencing muscle spasms from the apnea. Not everyone with sleep apnea has spasms, but that their muscles are primed for spasm because of the apnea. They get into an accident, their muscles go into spasm as anybody's would, but their sleep apnea primed muscles then stay in spasm. There's more to read in the section. Next, I discuss why fibromyalgia is worse at high altitude, and at the end of the chapter, there's a video animation on sleep apnea. This next section is very important because it is so common with patients. Most of your patients you suspect will say, I do not have sleep apnea, which manifests two different ways, as stopped breathing, which is the snoring and gasping for air that everybody's familiar with, and shallow breathing, which is the damaging type and people are unaware that they're doing. I know this because most of my fibromyalgia patients say this. When the pulse oximeter test comes back positive, they're surprised to find that they do have sleep apnea. Do they snore? Automatic sleep apnea. Do they have fibro fog? Sleep apnea. Tired during the day? Sleep apnea. Sleep disturbances? Pressure in the chest at night? Sleep apnea. These symptoms they're blaming on fibromyalgia are from sleep apnea and not the other way around. The reason they do not realize they are shallow breathing or have stopped breathing episodes is because they are asleep. It is important to realize that sleeping and breathing when you sleep are two different subjects. Another way to say this is that it's not about not getting enough sleep, it's about not getting enough oxygen. Therefore, they may sleep through the night, but not be breathing well during sleep. It's not about how much sleep a person gets, it's about how much oxygen they get. Many people say they do not snore or gasp for air. This gasping for air may not add up to a lot of oxygen lack. However, it is the ongoing shallow breathing that they will be unaware of that does add up and deprives them of oxygen and does the harm. So how many people have I helped? The last chapter in the book has 10 case studies which I documented. It was a lot of work to follow these 10 and document their success. I have helped many more. 
Over the course of the last four to five years now, I would say I have attested 250 plus patients and helped many of them. To the degree the patient clears up their apnea, their symptoms improved. So there are many partial successes. However, these patients are happy with their partial success. Many are happy just to finally know what's wrong with them. Over and over again, they will say, why hasn't anybody told me this before? The answer is that it is a slow process for new innovative medical concepts to take hold. Sometimes I'll tell them that they're lucky they got to see me. Treating sleep apnea is tricky. There are a number of treatments that the medical community does. Over time, I came up with additional innovative ones as well. These are discussed in the chapter on treatment. You may notice that I present this whole topic as a means to improve patient care and to uncover what is really wrong with the patient and provide the correct remedy. It took me three years to discover the cause of fibromyalgia as we have previously discussed. I spent four to five more years working with my patients in the trenches, discovering what works and how to accomplish it. This has been no small undertaking. Now I'm trying to pass this information on to as many people as I can. What to do next? This presentation is geared for those that live locally. The main thing to do is call for an appointment. You can also visit the webpage for pricing information. For those who live far away, you can buy the book and I will do a subsequent live event like this, which will cover what steps to take next. Patients get referred to medical doctors and dentists as needed. I never tell patients not to go to their doctor or dentist once we document sleep apnea. In fact, I tell them to go, but I give them my treatment recommendations and let them know what to expect, which is that the doctors undertreat and only use the CPAP. They will want to do the suggestions in the book at the same time they're waiting to go through the long medical process. Sleep apnea is not easy to treat because there are many causes and complications. Some of these require an involved set of treatments and some are quite easy to address. Everything you need is in the book. However, the three lectures will make it so that you do not have a steep learning curve. There's already enough to learn. For your chronic pain patients, whether they have been labeled to have fibromyalgia or not, I strongly encourage you to begin the program and start to check them. If patients simply go to their doctor and get checked for sleep apnea, they may not get the correct answers and treatment. Currently, doctors are not looking for different causes of sleep apnea. They just use the CPAP machine on everyone. Patients have a lot of difficulty using the CPAPs. However, I find only about one third have the cause of apnea that may need a CPAP machine, and there are better options for many of these people. Approximately two thirds of patients will have one of two other causes of apnea and will not need a CPAP machine at all. Additionally, doctors only treat moderate to severe sleep apnea. If you have a more milder presentation, you may be told that there's nothing wrong with you and your path to solve your fibromyalgia will come to a stop. So to have your condition worked up thoroughly and to be given many treatment options, I believe this is the office you want to go to. Has your previous doctor figured any of this out yet? What about the cost? This is on our website. It's $400 for the initial workup, but if you call today, it's reduced to $300. This takes two visits. On the first visit is the history, beginning of the exam, and you will be sent home with an overnight post-ox test. On the second visit, we will go over the results of the test and continue the exam and outline treatment. Follow-up treatments are $50. For many, there are additional costs such as products to buy, and for some, there's medical and dental referrals. Insurance does not pay for this. Insurance may pay for chiropractic treatment, but these would be done on different days. So to make the call or visit our website and make the call. Alternately, you can visit my chiropractic website. The pricing for fibromyalgia treatment is not on this website, but if you want to see more about our office, you can look here. The phone numbers are the same, 303-800-8800.